The death of Fidel Castro has sparked a variety of responses from across the world. The Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn called him a huge figure and praised his heroism, while President-elect Donald Trump condemned his legacy as one of firing squads and unimaginable suffering. Well, the Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell has said that he counts Lenin and Trotsky as among his heroes, and he joins me now from West London. Hello to you. Um, Jeremy Morning. Corbyn... Jeremy Corbyn described um, Castro as a huge figure with many achievements. Is it appropriate uh, to describe a man in those terms when we know that he didn't allow free and fair elections, that he locked up gay men, uh, and that he imprisoned his political opponents? Yes, there are, very, there are many flaws in the Cuban regime and, and many criticisms that uh, many people made, including ourselves. But... For my generation, if you look back on this, the immense achievement of the Cuban Revolution, this was a country that was controlled by effectively a kleptocrat where there was extremes of wealth and poverty, no education, no health service, and the land controlled by landlords while peasants literally starved. And so the revolution took place and it redistributed wealth and the land. It introduced a, an education service and a health service, which was well, second to none in the world in some instances. And so, it, and it also supported freedom struggles in South Africa, it supported the ANC against apartheid and other struggles in Latin America. So it was a beacon of hope for many people. But yes, of course, there were flaws and you cannot but criticise those. But again, in the face of the blockades and the opposition from the US, the achievements of the Cuban revolution have to be admired, particularly with regard to education, health and redistribution of wealth. You talk about the achievements in education. It may be true uh, that the regime helped people to read, but then it told people what they were and weren't allowed to read. If it was as great as you say, then why didn't they hold free elections? They would, it would have been a landslide, wouldn't it? Well, I think what's interesting, I, with the blockade lifted and Obama's new relationship with Cuba as well, I think there was a, you could see a path towards elections, you can see a path towards a greater liberalisation in terms of uh, literally other basic freedoms. And you, you can see how the foundations of the revolution can actually be built upon. I think looking back overall, history will judge that this was a force for good. But yes, you've got to be honest about the criticisms of the regime as well. Are you effectively giving Fidel Castro a free pass because he's left wing? If a right wing politician had acted in this no. way, particularly with, reduced, with respect to people like homosexuals, you would have been first out of the blocks to criticise them. Well, we were. We were. And of course, we're not given a free pass on issues like that. Of course not. But you have to judge overall. And you've got to praise where there are, well, as I say, Im immense breakthroughs, particularly with regard to how they redistributed wealth and the land, the education system, the health system. That was inspirational. But of course, there are flaws. And, and of course, that has to be criticised. But as I said, I think looking at it overall, overall, I think history will judge that it was a force for good. Well, your views coming across uh, very strongly there, uh, Mr. McDonnell. Let's move on and talk about the autumn statement. It was a bit of an open goal for you, wasn't it? Um, borrowing, ballooning, another missed deficit target. And yet you couldn't even get your own MPs to listen to you. They were buried in their mobile phones. What went wrong? <laughs> yes, I know I've made this comment elsewhere. Within the House of Commons chamber now, and the Speaker has raised this too, during debates, what you'll see happening increasingly is MPs of all political parties on their mobile phones either receiving messages or updating themselves on the commentary that's going on outside or tweeting out themselves. Now, I don't, make, you know, I don't make any judgment on that. I think the general public will have to make their judgment on that. But it seems to be a new, well, a new practice over the last couple of years that's happened in Parliament. And it's interesting, you know, it isn't just Parliament. It's other walks of life as well, where that new technology is used to have almost a continuous dialogue yourself with people outside of the main debating chamber or even the meeting that you're in. I, as I say, I think it's up to the public to decide. But what was in, well, the, interesting enough on the autumn statement, I think we did get our messages across very clearly. In fact, you've just quoted them back to us. We said that the government on its own metrics had failed on every target, on debt and deficit and the welfare cap, and on all the other metrics about how the economy was going in terms of wages growth and growth and business investment, it was failing on those as well. And I think that message has come across loud and clear. But also, I think there's a real... 
there's a real disillusionment with what happened on, on Wednesday as well. All those promises from the government about helping, the just about managing were, were, well, all those promises were basically broken. In fact, we're finding that people could lose up to a couple of thousand pounds a year now. Even the so-called living wage increase was not what was promised and people, people are losing money as a result of that. So there's a I think we did get the message across on all the government's metrics and I think it's increasingly now what we're finding is that the government's autumn statement proposals are being exposed and promises being broken. You've raised one as well which was hidden in the commentary around the autumn statement which is about the triple lock on pensions. Pensioners now who, you know, as a result, I believe, as a result of the, the Labour government that was in place, uh, actually have been lifted largely out of poverty. Many of them still struggle, but we've in improved a lot of pensioners in our society dramatically, particularly under a Labour government. But now the triple lock is threatened. And as a result of that, what we're seeing is pensioners fearful about their futures. You talk about the public uh, being the opinion that matters to you, but actually if you look at some of the polls, things are pretty gloomy uh, on your own ratings. Mm. Sky data say that 36% of people trust Philip Hammond to run the economy compared to just 7% saying you. 7%, that's pretty low. Yes, it is, but look back on the polls, the continuing polls since 2007, 2008, and literally that's been this case all the way through, and that's because... I think it's because Labour were in power during the period of the crash. They didn't cause the crash. That's a, the narrative that was developed and it was wrong. You know, the, the, the deficit before the crash didn't cause the crash. It was crash that caused the deficit. So all the way through, there's been that polling lead on economic credibility for the Conservatives who took over after us in, in, in 2010. But again, even back to 1997, before Tony Blair and Gordon Brown were elected, Again, they still weren't ahead of the, their they, they weren't ahead of the Tories in terms of economic credibility, and that's unfortunately the position of opposition parties. I think actually, though, all down I don't, to, I don't um, think people trust polls much these days. I don't think people trust polls much these days. But I think underneath all of this is a con increasing disillusionment with the promises of this government, and increasingly a growing, a growing demand for change. I'm not sure we can put it all down to historical issues. 20% uh, of Labour voters who voted for Labour in 2015 still say that they trust you. So that's a, a, quite a large number who don't say that they trust you with managing the economy. What are you going to do to try and sort out that trust? What are the really difficult decisions that you are prepared to take? Well, what we're trying to do now is raise the whole level of economic debate beyond what it's been up until now and get to the real truth of the matter. The reason that we've got problems at the moment facing Brexit, and it came in the figures that we were revealed last week, there's a £120 billion deficit that we're facing at this rate. What does that come from? First of all, less than half is coming from the threat of Brexit. The rest is coming from the mismanagement of the economy since 2010. How has that been mismanaged? Well, first of all, an unfair taxation system where there's been tax cuts for the wealthy and unfortunately cuts in terms of benefits and public services for the rest of us. In addition to that, I think uh, uh, really a failure to tackle tax evasion and tax avoid avoidance. So the key issue for is, first of all, you get a fair taxation system. Second, once you've got a fair taxation system, you can start investing your economy. Now, last, Thursday, last Wednesday, we heard from the Chancellor that there will be some investment, but nothing on the scale that's needed. And we've had six wasted years. That's why we're so unprepared for Brexit and ill-equipped. What we need is a fair taxation system. Then you use those resources to actually grow the economy by investment. And as a result of growing the economy, you can, then, you can afford the public services that you need. Let's uh, talk specifically about policy, because you've been very clear that Labour needs to be a government uh, in waiting with policies ready to be taken off the shelf in the event of a general election, which there is a chance, of course, next year that there could be a general election. So what exactly is Labour's policy on the biggest issue of all on Brexit? Are you in favour of staying in the single market, yeah. of being in the customs union or of being outside so that you can strike free trade deals on your own? OK, well, we set out red lines. I did a speech a week after the referendum, so we were very clear then. The red lines are these. Let me run through them with you. First of all, access to the single market. That's what we want. So access to, to the single the, market. You want to be in the single Secondly, market. Is that right? Is sure. You're saying that you want to be in the single market. Is Sorry? that right? Are you saying that you want to be in want the single access. market? 
We want access to the single market. Access. Ideally, I'd like membership, but I don't think we can go that far in terms of what political support there is. So access to the single market as a minimum. We want also to ensure that we get access to our financial services because they're a key sector for our economy. We want also to preserve the rights of UK citizens in the EU as well as EU citizens here. We also want to protect the uh, regulations that we have now from Europe, both in terms of employment and environmental protection. And then finally, I want to secure uh, our continuing involvement in the European Investment Bank because we get a good in, well, we get a good deal with the European Investment Bank, particularly in terms of investment in our regions. Now, they're the red lines we set out within a week of the referendum. Now, we're saying to the government, on a number of these issues, we can work in the interest of the country, we can work in a bipartisan way, putting country above party, but we need to know where they're going, what is their objective, what is their strategy, and that hasn't been forthcoming. Final question, John McDonnell. Um, do you think that Donald Trump's election is good news for Jeremy Corbyn because it shows that people want to go for anti-establishment candidates? Or is it actually bad news because even when people don't want business as, as usual, it indicates that they're going for candidates on the right rather than those on the left? It's interesting that I think the Trump election does demonstrate that people are absolutely frustrated with the existing system and do want change. But the type of change that Trump has put forward in his campaign statements is certainly not the route that any, well, any progressive or modern country would want to go, go down that path. And I think what we need to do in this country is recognise that actually people don't feel they're getting a fair deal. They don't believe that the government is acting in their interests at the moment, that they do feel that there's an elite establishment, particularly in Westminster, that's completely ignoring them. And what they want now is a, a radically fairer and more democratic and more equal society. And I think Jeremy Corbyn offers that hope. John McDonnell, thank you.